Welcome back to Cool Crips 2022. I'm Rebecca, your MC today. And before we jump into our next session, I would like to kindly remind all of you that after this session, we will have a good photo time. So we'd like to invite everyone on site and online to join us for the group photo that will be um, occurred on the EventX platform. So uh, please join us later after this session for a group photo. So, okay, right now, we're moving on to our next talk, the experimental and theory talks. We have our speakers online ready. So right now, we'd like to welcome our session chair, Alexey Bedrov. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let us then start the first talk of our session. So it's great pleasure to have talk by Bo Lee here about quantum state transfer over 1,200 kilometers, assisted by pure distributed entanglement. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks to the chairman. Uh, can you see my screen now? And the yes. laser point? Yes, okay. we screen laser point. Okay, it's a great honor to be here to attend the QCRIP 2022. And uh, I'll give you a presentation about our um, recent experimental work, uh, which is uh, uh, accomplished with the MISIUS quantum satellite. And the title of the report is a quantum state transfer over 1,200 kilometers assisted by prior distributed entanglement. Uh, my name is Bo Li. I'm from the University of Science and Technology of China. And this work has recently published on statistical reviews letters, and you can check it online. Okay, uh, our works is uh, basic on the idea of teleportation, which was proposed uh, by Professor Bennett in, in, in 1993. And it, uh, teleportation is a well-known protocol. It allows a knowing quantum state of, the, of a physical system be mirrored at one place and then be reconstructed at another place Early experimental verifications was done in 1997 by two groups. Uh, one is uh, uh, accomplished by Professor uh, Leidinger, uh, which is the known as the three photon teleportation experiment. Uh, the belt state uh, analysis is carried on one of the entangled photons and, uh, and, and another uh, heralding uh, single photon source and uh, another famous uh, experiment is uh, done by Professor uh, Popskew, uh, which is known as the two photon version of uh, the te uh, teleportation scheme. And, and after these two uh, famous experiments, and uh, uh, after 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 that. Uh, uh, people are uh, are developing to, uh, towards the longer distance uh, on the teleportation uh, in fiber channels. Now the transmission distance has reached uh, to over 100 kilometers. Now also in the free space channels, the distance has exceeded 100 kilometers. Uh, it uh, and also uh, to to carry out a longer distance. Uh, Experiment uh, on the ground on, on the Earth uh, is uh, uh, the, the experiment is limited to the curvature of the Earth. So experimenters uh, began to uh, looking for the help of, of the satellite platform. Uh, in in 2016, uh, China has launched the MISIUS satellite. It's a low Earth orbit uh, quantum satellite. A, it carried an entangled photon source uh, on the orbit. Uh, with, the, with the help of this, uh, this uh, satellite, uh, the USCC team has uh, uh, carried out uh, teleportation uh, from the ground to satellite uh, in 2017. Uh, uh, all this uh, experiment uh, has uh, made a great achievement, but, uh, all, uh, but there are also some limits uh, limitations uh, uh, is uh, to the lim they are limited to the point-to-point -point communication. So we are looking forward a more interesting application scenario, uh, which is the teleportation with the prior uh, entanglement distribution. 
uh, this is our experimental setup. We use the uh, the entangled uh, photon source on the missile satellite. It uh, can send the photon pairs to uh, remote uh, uh, to ground stations. And uh, uh, here we adopted uh, the scheme uh, developed by Professor uh, Popescu. And the, we uh, encoded the quantum information on one of the uh, entangled photon, uh, one photon of the entangled photon pairs. Um, after the, uh, so there is uh, several technical challenges in our experiment. The first is we have to make sure that uh, the entanglement uh, source uh, carried on the satellite has a good performance. And this, uh, and the second is that the single photon trans uh, transferred from the satellite to ground have to uh, result in a good uh, uh, interference uh, visibility. And uh, there's a, a pioneer uh, uh, works on uh, on the, in the year to, uh, 2016. Uh, it shows us that the interference at the single photon levels along the satellite ground channels is possible. Uh, however, however, for festival quantum teleportation, we still need the uh, overall state of fidelity uh, over three thirds. I'm sorry, Bully, we have to finish shortly. So please uh, go to results uh, because we have to be in time. In. OK. So, this, uh, the, uh, so we have to, we have developed uh, uh, stable uh, interferometer to uh, deal with the problem for the single photon interf interference in the, under the turbulent uh, channels. And uh, the third challenge in the, uh, in the satellite uh, experiment is the polarization in the satellite to ground links. And we have uh, to deal with the factors which affect the polarizations, which include the satellite rotations integument source itself and uh, the single mode fibers and other factors or uh, the the instrument we use to comp compensate compensate uh, the polarization is uh, using the three wave planes and uh, we also test uh, the the performance of this strategy along the uh, satellite to ground links okay this is this is our uh, state transfer uh, a process. I I will not. Uh, I will just skip this part and this our uh, results. And we have transferred six uh, uh, distinct uh, polarized uh, states, uh, which is S three, uh, 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 fifty and minus fifty in the uh, right hand and left hand. This states has uh, overall fidelity over uh, over two thirds, which has shown that the uh, quantum state transfer is a uh, uh, quantum behavior. And uh, now uh, I have make a brief uh, conclusion that we have uh, uh, successfully. Uh, can, can we say the time for the question? So I assume that we can see the conclusion. Thank you very much for your talk. First OK, of all. okay. We, we have make uh, this is a great uh, experiment for transfer states. And next step is include the practical quantum memory into this uh, uh, experiment and future we will de uh, develop a high brightness uh, source to perform long baseline single photon interference and also we are developing uh, a high orbit uh, satellite to explore the interplay of quantum theory and uh, the uh, gravitation okay that's all thank you thank you thank you very much uh, we have time for short questions so you can either raise hands uh, in the chat or uh, i assume that can be some questions on site Right. Is it? Are there any questions on site? Mm, I don't think we have any questions here. Any questions online? Any questions online? You can raise hands and so any. Yes, maybe. Ah, yes, there is one question. So, do you actively compensate polarization? It's a question from Kim Machul. Uh, yes, we, we uh, before we carry out uh, the ex uh, experiment and uh, collect the data, we have uh, we have to compensate the whole links from the entanglement source to the ground station, and to make sure that the polarization is correct. OK, 
Okay, any other questions? How long uh, was the satellite visible to the two ground stations? Uh, the, the, the satellite is a low orbit satellite, so it flies uh, very fast. And the, uh, so it only stay in the common view of the two ground station for about uh, five minutes. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting talk and uh, answer on the questions. So I think that uh, we can, we can uh, thank the speaker again and uh, go to the next session of this talk. Okay, thank you. So the, uh, the next uh, talk of the session will be given by Dominica uh, Ribezzo about connecting three countries without inter-European -Euro uh, network. So please, floor is yours. Let me remind us, it's six minutes for the talk and four minutes for Q&A. Yes, we can sh see your screen, uh, but we can't hear you. We can't hear you, sorry. Oh, we still can't hear you, cannot hear you. You somehow fixed it when we uh, were on sound check. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning again. Uh, I'm Domenico Ribezzo from uh, the National Institute of Optics in Florence, Italy, and University Federico II. And uh, I will tell you something about uh, the quantum network that we established uh, last, uh, last year, connecting three European countries. So after a little introduction, I will show you the network architecture and the protocol that we used, then the setup, and then we will go to results and conclusions. So, uh, since 1984, many steps have been done uh, in uh, QKD. Uh, so, like, uh, new protocols have been uh, tried, uh, experiments uh, over uh, different infrastructures, both uh, in the labs and field trials. Uh, there are already companies selling commercial devices, and uh, finally, the first quantum networks are appearing. What you can see here is an example of uh, the most advanced quantum network in the moment that is in China and connects uh, uh, more than uh, 40 cities from Shanghai to Beijing. In Europe, unfortunately, we still don't have uh, such a network, but the, there is the European Quantum Communication Infrastructure, EuroCCI, that aims the purpose of building one within 2027. What we did is uh, the first step of this project. So like uh, we built uh, this network and uh, we used the, the quantum key shared to encrypt a video call during the G20 Digital Ministers meeting that was held in uh, Trieste in August 2021. And the video call was used to broadcast concerts from Ljubljana and Zagreb conservatories. So you can see that uh, there was the first transmitter in uh, Trieste. Uh, then uh, the, so it was producing uh, the quantum signal and the classical synchronization signal on a second fiber. Then uh, there was a switch uh, that split, it, split the, signal, the signals in two and routed them towards Rijeka in uh, Croatia, where there was uh, a receiver and uh, acted as a final user, and then towards Postojna in uh, Slovenia. In Postojna, there was a second receiver to communicate with Ljubljana, and Postojna didn't act as a final user, but just as a trusted node, and Ljubljana was the other final user. So we use the variation of BB84, that is the three-state efficiency BB84 with one decoy and the time being encoded. Uh, time being encoded means that the arrival time of the photon with respect to the time slot makes the state in the Z basis, while in the X basis, uh, there are, uh, the wave function is, is uh, uh, both of the pulses in the, in the Z basis, since it's the superposition, and the relative phase between them makes the state. We didn't produce the uh, pi phase state uh, because uh, it's how this protocol works and this makes uh, the setup easier. Uh, also, because of this, uh, you cannot use the X basis as uh, uh, to exchange the key, but just uh, for security checks. So, uh, sorry. 
So uh, the states were produced by carving a continuum wave C-band laser with an intensity modulator driven by uh, an FPGA board that was uh, uh, that was producing a preloaded sequence, a repeated preloaded sequence of 4,095 bits. Then the the states were attenuated in order to reach the single photon level. The FPGA was also producing a slower uh, uh, synchronization signal that, uh, with another intensity modulator, was uh, was uh, encoded and uh, injected in the second fiber. Bob sites, uh, we had a beam splitter that was acting as a basis choice. So the Z uh, the Z basis were uh, photons were directly uh, sent to a single photon detector, a NINGAS detector with 20% of uh, detector, uh, detecting efficiency. And uh, for the X basis, the photons had to pass before through a delay line interferometer that uh, was an interferometer with the, with the particularity that the two paths had a different length. So uh, the, in the end, uh, the two uh, the two pulses that were 800 picosecond distanced uh, overlapped, and uh, finally we we could check uh, which was uh, the the phase between them. And moreover, um, with uh, another laser uh, that then was monitored and was control, and this monitor was controlling a phase shifter in order to stabilize the interferometer. So you can see that uh, in the link showing uh, 14, around 14 dB that were Trieste Postoina and Ljubljana Postoina, we got a key of uh, 2080 and 3130 bit per second. The reason of the difference is that we used the different uh, interferometers, so the losses were not the same in the both links. And uh, in the trieste rieka link that had the 25 dB of uh, channel loss, we used the neutral loss free space interferometer, so we could manage to have uh, 600, more than 600 bits per second of key. We also tested the stability of the system. Here you can see the trieste postoina, uh, like a stability measurement of the trieste on the trieste postoina link. So, like we checked that the system was uh, stable and reliable for uh, seven hours. Uh, moreover, we uh, didn't take uh, two big block sites because since uh, it was a, a live uh, experiment, uh, we wanted uh, that we didn't want that the post-processing methods acted as a bottleneck, and we wrote all the post-processing algorithms from scratch in a, in, the, in a, an efficient way. So to conclude, uh, we should remark that uh, we did the first step towards a European quantum network, and we gave a QKD demonstration in, a, in an important political event, so going out just from the P6 audience. And uh, we put together different infrastructures, and we cooperated with the different European partners. In the future, the, for, uh, as an improvement, we should implement a quantum random number generator, uh, instead of the preloaded uh, sequence, and uh, we should do the phase randomization of the different uh, of the different. Uh, so uh, you can see here all the people that made this possible uh, from uh, from several countries and several institutions and company. And uh, finally, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, so we have time for questions. So do we have uh, questions on site? Uh, meantime, you can also raise hands for the questions in chat. Any questions on site? Yes, we do have a question here. Yes, please. Um, could you comment on how much you lose in terms of the security if you are processing all these in blocks? Sorry, all these in blocks? Right, so you say that you wanted to have it, um, I mean, you're processing all this real life and you don't want to uh, uh -huh. make it big? Yes. Yeah, uh, we didn't choose uh, two big block sites. This is not a losing of uh, security, it's just a losing of uh, key rate. Like if you use bigger block sites, you can estimate, that, yeah, this is a particularity of the three states uh, protocol. Uh, you have to estimate the phase error rate because uh, you are just producing one uh, one state in the X basis. So uh, if you have bigger block sites, uh, you can have a, a higher key rate because you have a better estimation of the phase error rate. Uh, using uh, yes. smaller block sites. Sorry? 
Yeah, using smaller block size, you just uh, you just uh, have less key rate. But it was a compromise that we wanted to end we deal with. On we have two questions from chat. So, what is the operation speed of the system? Uh, yes, the rate was uh, 595 megahertz, the generation rate of the qubit. Uh -huh. And uh, did you somehow control the working point the, uh, of the used modulators with feedback loop or anything else to achieve more stability? Yes, like uh, you mean how it was working the phase lock loop? I, I think there was so, a, the question from... Uh, yeah, there was a contra-propagating uh, laser, uh, so it was doing the way in the... It was working the other way from... Uh, like it was starting from the output and we were reading it from the input and they were uh, combined together with a dense wavelength division multiplexing. And uh, then we were monitoring the, the phase of this, uh, of, this, of this laser. And then there was a phase, a phase shifter uh, connected to, P to a PID that uh, uh, looking at this feedback was uh, adjusting uh, like uh, continuously the, the phase. Yes, thank you very much uh, once again for a very interesting talk. So thank you. Uh, uh, let us proceed further to the next talk by Adamas by Luca. A deep learning based Tempest attack on a QKD sender. So please. Right, so um, I'm here to talk about uh, side channel attacks, classical side channel attacks. And uh, this is work from the University of Munich in Germany. And when we talk about side channel attacks and quantum key distribution, usually what we talk about is uh, either the quantum state that's transferred by the quantum channel has some information that we don't want the attacker to access. So we don't want it to be there to be accessed. Or we're talking about information uh, on the classical service channel. However, there are also more possible side channels. For example, uh, you can have classical side channels, including in particular unintended classical emissions, acoustic or electromagnetic leakage of information from devices, either the transmitter or the receiver. In our case, we are looking at information leakage that is electromagnetic from our self-built um, quantum key distribution transmitter. So first, let's see uh, what is the state of research on Tempest attacks. Again, Tempest includes electromagnetic acoustic power consumption and uh, similar side channels. And over the years, there have been many attacks on commercial uh, devices and also consumer grade devices. Nowadays, there are standards and certifications to make sure that no information is leaked. However, um, the field is still very much going on. And uh, these attacks are made much easier to implement and more effective by use of deep learning methods, which is also what we use. For example, recently people have been able to extract cryptographic keys via electromagnetic emissions from Bluetooth devices, consumer grade devices at 15 meters away, and uh, perhaps surprisingly using a microphone, so via the acoustic side channel at 10 meters away from a laptop. And uh, I think this uh, is a good example of why we have to look at such side channel attacks because uh, initially, at least I would have assumed that this is impossible because the time scales that a laptop operates at are very different to the time scales that air uh, propagates in air. Uh, sorry, sound propagates in air. So our QKD sender implements the BB84 protocol with four states. And since we are only discussing the sender, uh, I'm going to use these four states with equal probability and we send them at 100 megahertz. The way it works is we have an FPGA here and the FPGA controls four uh, electronic circuits that uh, create short pulses that in turn uh, drive an optical uh, module. And we are primarily interested in the electronics here. And we just record these emissions with a magnetic field probe. This is basically a coil of wire. We sample it with an oscilloscope and uh, we use 20,000 symbols. This is a sim these are four states are called symbols to um, make a upper key. So now um, we assume in the attack model that the attacker has a copy of the device. Then the attacker can use this copy to learn uh, to train a neural network in our case, how to extract information from the emissions. And finally, in the actual attack, the attacker has only one chance to read an unknown key during the normal 
mode of operation on the real device. And this implies that we use different keys for training and evaluation on the one hand and for the test on the other hand, which uh, all of our measurements uh, and accuracies that we report are derived from. And um, the way we did this is we record a trace, so two mega samples, 100 samples per symbol of the 20,000 symbol long key. And we take uh, five symbol long pieces and we train the network to predict the middle symbol. And here you can see the raw data and it's not obvious how you can extract information from this. However, when you take a neural network and we will release both the data and the neural network uh, in open source uh, once uh, this is finished, uh, you can train it in less than five minutes on seven measurements, seven times uh, 20,000 symbols. And uh, this works very well. Uh, because at distances of a few millimeters from the printed circuit board, we get basically all of the raw key, all of the raw symbols out again. Random guessing is 25% because um, uh, we predict not the key, the sifted key, but we predict the raw symbols. So we don't have to talk about basis choice. And uh, at distances of about nine centimeters, the attack is no longer successful. Also shielding helps mitigate this attack. Uh, if we look at 2D, we see here the test accuracy, so how well we can predict the key per symbol on average. And here we predict uh, almost all of the raw key symbols. In some regions, uh, we don't predict the symbols. This is also correlated with the amplitude that we measure. Some parts of the circuit emit emission that is not correlated with the key. And this means that the attack doesn't work in those uh, regions. More details in the longer version of the talk. We also tried to measure in the far field with a big antenna at two and a half meters, we were not able to get information about the secret key. However, we were able to get uh, information about the device's mode of operation. So we're distinguishing different settings uh, that the device is operating under. And this also you can find more details in the longer version of the talk, which is talk number 69. Um, and um, I would like to summarize, uh, side channels can render quantum key distribution devices insecure. And uh, we believe that it's important to look at uh, these classical side channels and not only quantum side channels, because although these side channels are not unique to quantum key distribution devices, it is well known in the research community that deals with these classical attacks that mitigating and uh, finding these vulnerabilities is much easier when you're in an early stage of development for your devices. Later in the design, uh, you have very few options other than starting over basically to make sure that these attacks are not a problem and uh, this uh, these kind of uh, design decisions can be specific to quantum key distribution which is why people building such devices should look at that and uh, going further we can ask whether a complete treatment of quantum key distribution side channels is uh, uh, possible However, we want this by complete, I mean here both quantum and classical attacks uh, considered in the same framework. For example, we can ask, is, does it make sense to assume that the attacker has Otherwise, all... Let us probably oh. uh, save some, question, uh, some time for questions, if you don't mind. So thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, I think that other audience can see open questions for the further research. So do we have any questions uh, on site? Yes, we do have one question on site. Yeah, uh, quick question. Uh, does the device independent implementation of QKD prevent this attack? I believe no, because in the divide, in the device independent implementation, you will have some part of your device that you are trusting. And uh, maybe it's not the QKD device itself, but it will be some device that you are using to process information that's secret. And this information will have to be somewhere. And on transfer, of this information, you will still have these kinds of side channels to worry about. In practice, they may not be a problem because you know that you have mitigated them, but uh, just in principle, you will still have something like this. Yes, thank you. We have three questions in chat. So the first from Vadim Makarov, so how thick does shielding needs, need to be? Um, we found that a few millimeters of uh, metal uh, okay. basically is enough. But we also found that having holes for ventilation can be a problem. So this, yes, this research is not uh, com finished yet. So I'm, I'm uh, hesitant to say anything definitive, but we, there can be problems with uh, holes in the shielding. Yes, uh, so how we can protect our QKD system from this type of attack? 
Yes, so uh, in the longer version of the talk, there are some, uh, there is a slide on countermeasures, and uh, this is a topic that's very widely studied in classical uh, hardware security research. So you can find a lot of materials, and then you can have to see which parts of these advices uh, apply to your setup, basically. So shielding is one thing, and um, also just simply good electronics design. So for example, good placement of capacitors on your circuit and uh, uh, using good um, basically good electronics design helps uh, reduce these emissions very much. Yes, thank you very much. We have two more questions in uh, the chat. If you can please type the answer there. So let us thank Adamas once again and proceed to the next talk of the sessions. It would be uh, given by Hang Lin Hu on um, quantum homomorphic uh, encryption. So please this virtual floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the introduction of the host. Uh, does it work now? Yes, uh, we can see. On site, can we see the screen and hear the speaker? Yes, we can see the screen and yeah. hear the speaker. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, my name is Yang Hu, and today I'm going to talk about my work with uh, Yin Kai Ouyang and Marco Toma Mikhail on privacy and correctness trade-offs for quantum homomorphic encryption. Uh, this talk uh, is mainly based on uh, this preprint on archive. OK, uh, yes, so uh, quantum homomorphic encryption, or QHE, is suspected to be a Swiss army knife of the quantum cryptography, which means that we can reduce a broad class of quantum cryptographic primitives to QHE. Uh, quantum oblivious transfer, or QOT, is an important and well-studied cryptographic protocol. And this motivates us to reduce QOT to QHE. Yes, uh, in our work, we introduce a formal definition of information theoretically secure QHE. And based on this definition, we can reduce QOT to QHE. And with this reduction, we can obtain many useful results. Uh, our main result is that we can translate bonds for QOT into bonds for QHE, and the bond is shown here. Uh, this bond reveals a uh, circuit privacy, data privacy, and correctness trade-offs for a broad class of QHE, which includes QHE that allows Clifford's. Yes. So uh, this is the scheme of QHE. Uh, Alice ah, so, so the the problem is that I don't uh, see the changing of the slides, at least on my Zoom, how it is on site. Oh, yeah, we can't see it moving either. Uh, I think it stays on the. OK, yeah, now now we can see the scheme. OK, uh, OK, yes, uh, this is the scheme. Uh, yes, so um, this is the scheme of the uh, homomorphic encryption. And Alice is a user. Uh, she has an uh, input and she wants to delegate some quantum computation to Bob the server. Uh, so she encrypts her input and send it to Bob. And Bob uh, can directly evaluate a quantum channel on this uh, on Alice's input without decrypting Alice's message. And then Bob sends the evaluated message back to Alice and Alice decrypts this evaluated message and directly obtains uh, uh, the desired output of this quantum channel. Yes. So, uh, sorry. Uh, so, properties of quantum uh, of QHE uh, are mainly correctness, which means that Bob can apply the quantum channel correctly on Alice's input, and uh, and data privacy, which means that uh, Bob is almost ignorant about Alice's uh, input, and circuit privacy, which means. Alice does not learn more than what she should about Bob's circuit. Yes. So uh, we, if we want to emphasize our definition of circuit privacy, um, not consider in an actual protocol, we have a we have a malicious Alice. She could send a corrupted message to Bob and keep a reference system of of this message, and, and an honest Bob will evaluate his quantum channel on this corrupted message and send the, the message back to Alice. And Alice could pos possibly gain more information from this uh, about Bob's circuit from this corrupted message and 
per reference system. And now we imagine that there is an ideal protocol in which we have a trusted third party Charlie. Charlie will keep uh, Alice and Bob's information um, confidential to both parties. In this case, Alice can send her plain tech, a uh, plain input to Charlie, and Bob can send his quantum channel to Charlie. And Charlie can apply this quantum channel on this input and send the output back to Alice. So uh, if Alice in, the, uh, in this ideal protocol can simulate the previous Alice in the actual protocol with a, a simulation map we call N, then we say that Alice in the actual protocol does not learn more about Bob's circuit than Alice in this ideal protocol, and we say that QHG is circuit private. Okay, now we introduce this QOT. Uh, in, a, in this QOT scheme, Alice input a request bit and Bob input two data bits. And after rounds of communication, Alice will get an output X hat, and both parties will determine if they accept this, this protocol or not. And ideally, Alice will learn, and he will, she will only learn uh, XI. So the properties of QOT are uh, completeness, which means uh, X hat equals XI, and soundness against Bob, which means Bob does not learn this uh, request bit I, and soundness against Alice, which, which means Alice does not learn the other bit than XI. Yes. So in order to perform the reduction from QOT to QHT, we introduce this uh, so-called, uh, we, we call it strong oblivious transfer channels, denoted by this FX0, X1. Uh, we first apply two completely defacing channels on both qubits, and uh, we apply two C0 gates, depending, uh, depending on X0 does not equal to X1. And then we apply a X gate on the second qubit if X0 is one. And then we apply a completely depolarizing channel on the first qubit. Okay. Um, now, suppose we have a QHT scheme that, uh, oh, sorry. I want to emphasize that the strong OT channels can be realized with only Clifford by replacing this completely the facing channel with random Z gates and replace this com completely depolarizing channel with random X gates and Z gates. Okay, so uh, suppose we have a QHG scheme that allows to delegate this strong OT channels. And now we show how to construct a QOT scheme. Uh, for Alice, she could input kit i kit zero into this QHG scheme. And for Bob, she could uh, he could evaluate this f x not x1 in this QHG scheme. And the second qubit of the output of this QHG scheme will be x hat, which, it, which should be xi. So in this way, we, we complete the re reduction. And yes, uh, young, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for, yes, for thanks. moving to this slide and uh, keeping time for questions. So thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So do we have questions on site? Any questions? Uh, in parallel, we can uh, have questions by raised hands online. So any questions online? So may, maybe I then ask a question. So could you please once again comment on the resources required for the implementations of the scheme, so in terms of uh, what is needed. Okay, um, the resources, uh, well, um, uh, this is a quite abstract uh, scheme and uh, we don't specify, uh, specify any resource we need and it's just a very general scheme. And for some concrete examples, uh, there is uh, uh, there are quantum homomorphic encryption schemes that uh, use quant uh, uh, that is based on quantum error correction codes and uh, the re results uh, this results we need might be some highly entangled state uh, to 
uh, to build a quant uh, to build a quantum error correction code. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, last call for the questions on site and online. If there are no questions, so thank you uh, very much once again for your talk, and we proceeding to the last talk of the sessions. It, uh, it is will begin by Zhao Zhang on mm -hmm. classical verifications of quantum computation in linear time. So this virtual so floor, floor is yours. Yeah. So could you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So hello everyone. I'm ha very happy to give this talk on the classical verification of quantum computation in linear time. I'm Zhao from Caltech, and this is the work in the Fox 22 this year. So what is classical verification of quantum computation? In this, uh, in this problem, Alice, which is a classical client, wants to validate the quantum circuit and get C0, but doesn't have the ability to apply C itself because it's classical. So it makes use of a remote quantum server. So it sends the circuit C to the server and server sends back the response. But it doesn't trust the server. So it wants to design a protocol to interact with the server and to verify the correctness of the result. Such that if the result is correct, you get convinced. But if the result is wrong, it could catch server cheating in this protocol. And this is a fundamental problem in quantum cryptography and the foundation of many quantum protocols, which has strong practical and theoretical motivation. So there are many things that works. And in the early stage, people focus on many different weekend settings. For example, people study what will happen if the client has a small quantum device and could send some uh, simple quantum states. And people can see that what if there are two non communicating servers. And based on the recent advice of quantum computers, we wonder whether it's possible to use a complete classical client and single quantum server to achieve this task. And this will require cryptographic techniques. And Mahadev, 18 paper, constructed such a protocol with a group assumptions. And in this type of protocol, uh, natural and practical, we can wait for a quantum computer and see. And Mahadev, 18 paper, turns out to be a great success. People have constructed many protocols based on this protocol. For, for example, multi party quantum computation, zero knowledge, and so on. And all these protocols are very fundamental group prim primitives, and the classical analog have been widely used in practice. So it seems that we have already solved the problem and contracted many sequence computer protocols. Everything is very good. It is the end of the story. So let's see what will happen if we run multi 18 protocols. So our client wants to use a protocol to verify a circuit C. So what will happen? If we take a closer look to the protocol, we will see the server need to run a circuit that is of cubic size of the original circuit. So in practice, the server will tell you, will tell you when the quantum computer is already very hard, how could we run a cubic, cubic, some cubic size protocol, which is, which is a very big blow up. So as a result, all the protocols based on the 18 paper has a cubic type capacity, which is very big terms of radicality. So here comes our result. We, we design a protocol that runs in linear time. And as I'm moderating, we only use a completely classical client and single quantum server. And we are still extensively use good graph assumptions. And the time capacity is, is only linear, which means the client side classical computation is linear and server side quantum computation is also linear. And we hope this will be the beginning of a new story. Uh, for example, we can try to design these protocols based on our linear type verification protocol. And we wonder whether we could take this protocol down to linear time. And in the future, could we take them into practice? So how could we achieve it? If we look at the current protocols, Mahadev 18 paper, and also it's it even works based on it, takes Hamiltonian approach. And this approach will inherently lead to a qubit type blow up. And we take, take a different approach, which is remote state preparation. 
So what it removes the preparation? Instead of verifying your circuit, we focus on a state family as the, we can do the following task. The client wants to send a random state from the state family. And in the end, the client will know the description of the state. The server will know the state itself. So this task will use quantum channel. And we ask whether it's, part, whether it's possible to use classical channel and cryptography to simulate this task such that in the end, the server knows the whole state and can't know the description of the state. So why should we care about it? Because we already know how to verify quantum computation if the client could prepare and send simple quantum states. There are many protocols and the FKD18 paper that is a protocol where the client only needs to prepare and send plus theta state, which is only simple single, qubit, single qubit state. And the total number is linear. So if we replace this protocol, replace this part by classical channel remote version protocol, we get a linear times CVQC protocol, verification protocol. So there are also some existing protocols for classical channel remote preparation. However, existing works has very big time capacity. It seems that CVQC remote preparation is even more difficult than CVQC. So here, here comes our result. We design a protocol that runs only linear time. And in the end, the client could get theta one to theta L and the server holds plus theta one to plus theta L. And we can compose this protocol with FKD18 paper to get a linear time verification protocol. In summary, we get a classic verification quantum computation protocol that runs at linear time. And we get, and along the way, we have a remote state preparation protocol for plus theta states that also runs at linear time. We hope we expect application of these results and techniques in very different, different problems, and we expect potential and practical impact of possibly improved version of protocols in the quantum computing era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your talk and being perfect in time. So we have uh, space for some questions. Uh, do we have some questions on site? Any questions on site? Yes, we do have one question here. Uh, since you talk about being practical, uh, what's the constant between before your linear time? You mean the constant blow up? Yeah. Uh, currently, uh, your analysis, analysis that's a very big constant, which might be 10 to the 2000, which is very big. But I think because our protocol does not have very complicated mechanism, so maybe in the future we can improve the analysis of protocol to uh, take it down. Okay, we see. Thank you. Any other questions on site? I don't see raised hands in the chat. So any questions? Any questions on site? Uh, yes. I can ask you another one. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Talk about application to like the uh, Pedro Butler technique, what do you think will be like a barrier to apply these to other results or would it just work? Could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. So, so like there are many, pro uh, many protocols that are based on Maha Davis protocol. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about maybe they can be altering into linear time. Uh, uh, technique. Because this is a they are all open problems. We can study them. So, so I guess I comment on what do you think? Is there going to be barriers in doing this, or you think you can just do it mm -hmm. every paper closely? Yeah. Uh, it's not easy to answer this question because I don't spend a, enough time really thinking think about this problem. And maybe possibly for these different problems, the, Obstacles are different. Mm -hmm. I don't have a. Uh, so maybe the first step to do is to construct a constant round protocol. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Any 
other questions, comments? So uh, we are in time with our session. So I would suggest to thank uh, the last speaker and all the speakers of this session. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank Alex, you very much for moderating this session and controlling the time perfectly. And thank you all of our speakers. This is the last session of the day. Uh, but for now, we'd like to invite all of you to join us for the group photo. So for our speakers, speakers and um, session chairs as well. I would like to invite all of you to join us for a group photo for the audience online. I would like you to join Event X. There is a group photo session. So just click on view detail and then you can join the photo shoot there. And for our audience on site, I would like to welcome all of you to be on stage. <laughs>